Ever since playing and loving Sucker Punch's 2020 epic Ghost of Tsushima, I've been eagerly awaiting a reveal of a possible sequel to that game. Rise of the Ronin popped upon the PlayStation Store, and although it wasn't as strong as Ghost, this game did scratch that itch for me. Now, this title did receive mixed reviews when it dropped. The story was pretty good, the combat was challenging at first with a steep learning curve, but once you got the hang of it, the combat became very enjoyable. There were a few parts of the game which could have done with some improvements, such as the relationship and bond feature, but that's not exactly relevant to why you are here watching this video. In the story, which spanned the course of 14 years, without spoiling too much from the off, there was a central narrative, if you like, and branching missions in which the player could choose whether to side with the Shogunate or to rebel against it. But these missions always led back to the same outcome, as the story only has one ending in keeping with real life history. Anyway, before we jump in, please be aware that there will be spoilers in this video for Rise of the Ronin. Let's begin. So this game takes place in the Edo period, which stretched from 1603 to 1868. The name Edo came from the city of Edo, which is where the Shogunate was based. Edo, of course, being modern day Tokyo. The first Shogunate was established in 1192, and just for reference, Ghost of Tsushima took place in 1274. Anyway, during the time between 1603 and 1868, the Tokugawa Shogunate ruled, and in this time, the Shogunate unified Japan, making it an isolated foreign land with peace, strong economic growth, a stable population, arts, culture, and a strict societal order. But all of that unity would be put to the test around a century into Tokugawa rule. With Japan itself sitting on the Pacific Ring of Fire, natural disasters would hit often. One of these was the eruption of Mount Asama, one of 111 active volcanoes in Japan, which resulted in cold weather and famine in 1783. This famine resulted in unrest, followed by protests over food shortages and taxes. This led to a growing bitterness between the Tokugawa Shogunate, which stretched into the 1800s. However, the Shogunate were concerned about a new threat. Following the First Opium War, which ended in 1842, and resulted in the British Indian forces setting up colonies in China, the Shogunate attempted to strengthen Japan against the possible threat of the West. A political doctrine of Sonojoi, which translates as revere the emperor expelled the barbarians, called for imperial rule, and was sought by many in an attempt to overthrow the Shogunate. But the Shogunate stood firm, and this pretty much leads us into the events of the game's prologue. Now, as already mentioned, there were pockets of people who wanted the Shogunate overthrown. Conflict was brewing. Landowners, feudal lords known as daimyo, were being watched by the Shogunate. They were under strict surveillance. They appeared to be loyal in public, but were scheming behind closed doors. Weapons were secretly being formed in preparation for rebellion against the Shogunate. However, the Shogunate found out about this scheming and took lethal action against the rebellion. One particular action was taken against the Kurosu clan, who had suffered heavy taxation and forced labour policies, which were forced upon it by the Shogunate. Shogunate spies came in and killed all of the villagers, and put a stop to any potential uprising. Two children from the clan cowered behind a cart and could only watch as a woman was cut down in front of them. They were saved in the nick of time by an older woman called the Bladesmith, part of a clan of warriors from the Kurosu clan that go back generations called the Veiled Edge. She kills all the Shogunate attackers, and takes the two children to safety. Many years later, the protagonist and his blade twin had now been trained in the Veiled Arts. After their extensive training, they meet with the bladesmith one day in 1853, and she tells the pair that they are ready for their very first assignment. They were to infiltrate one of the black ships, the name used for the ships belonging to the United States Navy. They were to obtain a secret message that detailed a potential trade treaty between the US and Japan. Whilst on the ship, they were also to assassinate Commodore Matthew Perry, the man who was tasked by his government to convince the shogunate to open up their ports. He basically told the Japanese that America would destroy them. With the current shogun, Ayoshi Tokugawa, too sick to carry out his duties, the shogunate were indecisive in how to handle the threat. They eventually allowed Perry and his fleet to land at Kurihama. Word was that fully aware of the military might of the US, the shogunate felt that they had no other choice but to cooperate, and the treaty was set to be signed. Swimming to the ship, the Blade Twins infiltrate and take out members of the US Navy. Making their way below deck, they enter Commodore Perry's office and discover the secret message. Now to assassinate the Commodore. Making their way back up on deck, the pair spot Perry looking out at Mount Fuji. They attempt to sneak up behind him, but this fails and a fight ensues. 
The Blade Twins overpower him, but just as they are about to strike a killing blow, he is saved by a mysterious samurai named the Blue Demon, who says that he can't let Perry die. The twins attempt to fight the Blue Demon, but he's too fast and way too strong for them, and he easily bests them both. He's well aware of the code of the Veiled Edge, that one of these Blade Twins will sacrifice themselves for the other out of duty. So just as the Blue Demon said, one of the Blade Twins rushes onwards towards the Blue Demon, but loses an arm with their fate undetermined. But this gives the other twin a chance to escape. Around five years later, the remaining twin, known only as the protagonist, stands at his Blade Twin's grave. All they could find of her was her scarf. The protagonist later has a dream of him and his Blade Twin, which leads him to believe that she's still alive, after all that was found of her was her scarf. The protagonist wakes up and finds Shogunate assassins in the village. Fighting his way up the hill, the protagonist helps out the bladesmith who is fighting off more assassins. After clearing them out, the bladesmith mentions that she's aware of what the protagonist has in mind, to abandon the Kurozu clan and go and find their blade twin. She says that she cannot allow him to do that, and the two of them fight to the death. The protagonist overcomes his master and says goodbye as the bladesmith dies. Before departing, the bladesmith states that once upon a time, she had a blade twin that died, and she says that she's had to live with the pain of surviving ever since. The protagonist leaves and is now a masterless samurai, also known as a ronin. The protagonist travels towards Yokohama. It's clear that lawlessness is rife. Bandits have taken over small villages and have forced locals out. After restoring order to one of these small villages named Ishikawa, the protagonist speaks with the village chief. The old man says that he has nothing on him to give him as a reward, but says that bandits stash their spoils inside a cave nearby. Going to this cave, inside, the protagonist comes across a man fighting a group of bandits. Taking out all the enemies, the man and the protagonist leave the caves, grabbing any loot they can find. The man seems to be receptive to Western influence, saying that Japan cannot afford to be left behind in the world. Despite that, he seems to care about the future of his country. He also mentions that he's from a place called Tosa, and that he left his clan. He was formerly a samurai, and he's now a ronin. He mentions that he was looking for a permit to be able to cross the bridge checkpoint into Yokohama. The eccentric ronin says that he might know of someone who has the permits they'll both need in order to get to Yokohama. There's a gang of thugs holed up in an old magistrate's home, so the protagonist and the ronin infiltrate their base and take them out. And they face the gang's leader, Gonzo. He's tough, but after a tense fight, Gonzo is taken down. He begs for his life, and in exchange, they can help themselves to whatever they want from his stores. Whatever the protagonist chooses to do, they search the stores and find what they were looking for. Permits. The Ronin introduces himself as Ryoma Sakamoto, and he tells the protagonist that the permit will allow him to help forge a brighter future for Japan, and tells the protagonist to meet him at the clock tower in Yokohama. Ryoma then leaves. The protagonist also manages to find a glider, allowing him to glide through the air. The protagonist then crosses the checkpoint, arriving in Yokohama. A group of people stand at the docks, and there seems to be some sort of commotion. The chief minister of the shogunate, Naosuke E, also known as the Red Demon, shows up. His men appear to be arresting troublemakers known as expulsionists, who are people opposed to foreigners being on their lands. The reason for this uprising and unrest is that the initial plans for Japan to enter into a trade treaty with the US were now underway, and the treaty was set to be signed in the coming days, and the US Navy's black ships were arriving into port. Meeting up with Ryoma at the clock tower, the protagonist explains that he's looking for someone, and Ryoma explains that he, too, is looking for someone. He has come to see someone named Shoin Yoshida, his master, and a man who has great vision for Japan's future. Shoin's students are already in Yokohama. Ryoma bumps into a geisha named Takamurayama. She invites them to go and visit her in the Pleasure District. So, Ryoma takes the protagonist there and says it's the best place for gossip. On the way, they are attacked by two retainers from Ryoma's old clan, the Tosa clan. Retainers being lesser samurai, who provided their services to more powerful clans. Arriving in the Pleasure District, Ryoma and the protagonist drink sake and enjoy themselves. Taka comes in and speaks with the protagonist. She reveals that she has heard rumours of a samurai that came to Japan aboard one of the black ships. Of course, before she reveals more, she needs the protagonist to do her a favour. She wants them to take some photos of the Pleasure District using a contraption known as a camera. So the protagonist goes to see a local inventor called Igasichi Azuka, and after obtaining some blueprints that were stolen from him, the protagonist obtains a prototype camera. After taking photographs of the Pleasure District for Taka, she has one more favour. The protagonist is to go to a room in the Pleasure District and take a picture of a man she calls Kagoro Katsura. Going to the room, the protagonist is overhearing a conversation. The men inside the room are talking about attacking the US consulate. 
A drunk samurai stumbles up to and speaks with the protagonist. He challenges the protagonist to a fight outside in the gardens. Surprisingly strong for someone who is drunk, the man is eventually defeated and simply goes to sleep. Ryoma shows up and he reveals that this drunk man is actually Katsura, the man in which the protagonist was supposed to look for. He's been helping Ryoma track down Master Shoin. Katsura is also one of his students. After they leave, Taka, as promised, says that when she went to the US consulate, she learned that the samurai that came in on the black ship is with the consulate itself, and that the samurai has something called a demon claw. What's more is that this samurai is the personal bodyguard of one Townsend Harris, who was the very first consul to Japan. Headed to the Sakura Inn, the protagonist speaks with a now sobered up Kagoro Katsura. He compliments the protagonist on their skills with a sword, but recommends they go to a proper dojo at some point. The men with him, Genzui and Shintaku, are also students of Master Shoin. Later on, meeting up with Taka, she reveals that the US consular is in a state of panic, as they are bracing for an attack from a group intending to assassinate Harris. Taka says that getting to Harris will mean his bodyguard with the demon claw will likely make an appearance. She asks the protagonist to meet her outside the consulate. On the other hand, if the protagonist goes and has a conversation with Kagoro Katsura and his friends at the Sakura Inn, they reveal it is their group behind the plan to assassinate Harris. They claim it's to do with the signing of the Harris Trade Treaty between the US and Japan. If Harris is dead, then the negotiations will cease and the treaty won't be signed. They too ask the protagonist to meet them outside the consulate. The protagonist can choose who to assist, the anti-shogunate group or Taka with her being pro-shogunate, who also wants the protagonist to find out who it is that is threatening Harris's life. Whatever they choose, the protagonist goes to the consulate and indeed finds it under heavy attack by the anti-shogunate forces. Encountering and confronting Harris, he fires a shot at them and sure enough his bodyguard shows up. It's her, the protagonist's blade twin, the samurai with the demon claw. She tells the protagonist not to get in her way, and the two of them fight. With her defeated, she jumps out of the window and leaves. With the failed assassination of Townsend Harris, the treaty is signed, and he is accompanied by Commodore Matthew Perry. The truth behind this treaty signing is that the Imperial Court, which was headed up by the Emperor of Japan, hadn't actually given permission for the Shogunate to sign this treaty. The Shogunate had approached the Imperial Court for permission to sign it, but before they had their express consent, Chief Minister Nasuke E authorised his negotiators to sign the treaty regardless. He was worried, since the British and the French were lurking, eager to cut themselves a slice. Nasuke E favoured developing relations with the West, but this was only in order that Japan could strengthen itself enough so that they could once again impose a policy of isolation and defend themselves against any foreign aggression towards Japan. He had assumed direct control of the government as Honorary Chief Counselor or Tyro, which was a position usually required during times of crisis. Anyway, back to the plot. With Japan now opened up to the world, Harris was the best lead to their blade twin, so the protagonist goes to see either Taka or Katsura. If going to see Taka, she confirms that Harris has gone into hiding. She doesn't know where he is, however, she does advise the protagonist to inquire at somewhere called the Grand Villa, a place where Westerners mingle with the high and mighty of Japan. Taka states that she has contacts within the Shogunate, which surprises the protagonist. In truth, Taka was the chief minister's spy. That's why she had the protagonist take pictures of the pleasure district. The pictures were her way of keeping an eye on the expulsionists, and she would report her findings back to Chief Minister E. In the meantime, she needs another job doing. She needs the protagonist to obtain a letter being held by the samurai clan of Mito at the Hodogaya post. She expresses that the letter is to be delivered directly to her. A conversation with Kagoro, on the other hand, sees him request the very same letter. Headed to Hodogaya post, the protagonist defeats the samurai there and obtains the letter. Speaking to the contact outside, he slips up and reveals that he was planning to double cross both sides and send the letter to the highest bidder. The protagonist can decide whether to hand the letter over to Taka or to Katsura. The letter in question was a decree from the Imperial Court, or the Emperor, Emperor Komai, to the Mito clan, which stated that the foreigners were to be expelled from the country, the shogunate was to be reformed, and Chief Minister E was to be dealt with. The Chief Minister burns the letter and he begins a brutal campaign, the Ansei Purge, in order to suppress the anti-shogunate forces. Going off of Taka's earlier advice, the protagonist heads to the Grand Villa. Once there, he speaks with a man named Yukichi Fukuzawa, another samurai who had been studying in the West and who was working for the shogunate. He's there with a man named Ernest Sato, a British interpreter. Whilst quite surprised by the protagonist's request for the location of Townsend Harris, given the previous attempt on his life, Yukichi agrees to take the protagonist to the area where Harris has been in hiding, since he too wishes to speak with Harris. 
Heading for the location, there are anti-shogunate forces everywhere, all of them looking for Harris. Reaching the console, he's being protected by a French swordsman, who after being defeated reveals himself to be Jules Brunet. Harris comes out and as expected, wants something in return for information about the protagonist's blade twin. You see, the nearby temple, which was originally a base for the US consulate, has been taken over by, as they call them, thugs, basically the expulsionists. Brunet and Harris were hiding for that very reason. Scoping out the temple, Yukichi and Brunei help to drive out the thugs. The expulsionist's leader is, of course, none other than the anti-shogunate Genzui, who the protagonist had previously met at the Sakura Inn. Defeating him, he asks the protagonist why he's working with the foreigners. In truth, the protagonist neither hates nor likes the foreign people in Japan. Genzui informs the protagonist that the Americans were the reason for the cholera outbreak in the nearby village, that having dealings with these westerners will endanger everyone in Japan. Reporting back to Harris, he's delighted that the expulsionists have been ousted from the temple. As promised, he gives the protagonist information on his blade twin. It seems that after the fight with the blue demon on the black ship in 1853, the injured blade twin was taken back to the US by Commodore Perry, and after having a prosthetic hand fitted, the demon claw, was held prisoner until it was discovered that they wanted to cooperate. After the treaty was signed, the blade twin simply disappeared the very next day, without even collecting their pay. Harris finishes by saying that the British may have also requested the services of the Blade Twin. A chat with Yukichi reveals that Shouin Yoshida is wanted by the Shogunate for conspiracy against the Shogun, and he imagines that Yoshida has already been apprehended. This is true, as Shouin Yoshida has been captured and has been brought before the Shogunate. He claims the Shogunate is not fit to rule, and he is sentenced to execution. With the news regarding Shouin Yoshida's pending execution reaching his people, the protagonist goes to the Sakura Inn. He meets a young woman called Fumisugi, and she's the wife of Genzuri and also Master Shuren's younger sister. The protagonist heads to Chinatown with Fumi in order to track down Shintaku Takasuki, another anti-shogunate that they have met earlier, who has been putting together a militia. Fumi runs off and the protagonist has to save her from Kuhita Irregulars, a militia belonging to the shogunate. After rescuing Fumi, the protagonist fights through more Kuhita Irregulars and has to fight with Shintaku, eventually defeating him. After their fight was called Fun, the protagonist tells him about Master Shouin. He accuses the protagonist of working for the Shogunate. By talking with Ryoma back at the Sakura Inn, a plan is revealed. A prison break in order to break Master Shouin out of prison. They need to act fast as he's to be executed very soon. Choosing their approach, they enter the prison. It doesn't take very long for them to reach Master Shouin's cell. However, he refuses to leave, stating that he's done nothing wrong and that to escape would be an admission of his guilt. Essentially, Master Shouin wants the sentence to be carried out and for him to become a martyr for a better Japan. He asks them to give a letter to his sister. It's his last will and testament. Genzui says that everyone will meet up at the Sakura Inn, so the protagonist and Fumi make a run for it. They are attacked by Shogunate assassins on the way back. Dazed and confused, the protagonist comes to and returns to the Sakura Inn. He informs the group that Fumi was taken by the Blue Demon. Master Shouin is to be transported to the execution grounds in Edo, and Genzui says that it's very likely that Fumi will be in Edo too. So, the group leave Yokohama for Edo immediately. On your feet! <laughs> Oh, wait. 
Your time has come. Rise as one. Joining up with Katsura and the other expulsionists at Saihoji Temple, to their surprise, Taka is there. Due to her connections to the Shogunate, she risked her life and managed to sneak Fumi out of the Shogunate's custody. She reports that an uprising by the Satsuma clan against the Shogunate is imminent. She suggests joining forces with them in their attempts to end the purge. Genzui has reservations, given the Satsuma clan's receptiveness to all things western, saying they cannot be trusted. With Master Shouin dead, Genzui will now take charge of the expulsionists' cause. Despite his reservations, Genzui says that they should join up with the Satsuma clan in order to forge a new Japan. Taka then approaches the protagonist privately and says she wishes to speak with him alone. Speaking with Taka, she reveals that she has reassessed her opinion of the Shogunate of late. Chief Minister E is a very important person to Taka. The hairpin she wears was a gift from him. E has changed though, with the man she knew having become the Red Demon. The recent purge has opened Taka's eyes and she knows that E must be stopped. However, Taka thinks that helping Fumi escape may have cost her her own life. She also says that she knows a back street they can use to reach the Satsuma Villa, out of sight of the Shogunate, which would be useful seeing that Edo is a Shogunate stronghold. Reaching the villa, the protagonist speaks with Genzui, who reveals that the Shogunate forces are marching on someone named Princess Atsuko. That's significant, as if the princess is taken by the Shogunate, the Satsuma clan will become hostages and will be kept in line by the Shogunate. Genzui tells Taka that she needs to get somewhere safe, and she leaves. Arriving at the Edo estate, the expulsionists find shogunate assassins there. After taking them all out, they are confronted by the blue demon and another fight ensues. This time they get the better of him. Princess Atsuko emerges safe and sound and thanks them for their help in saving her. Another of the Satsuma clan shows up. He tells the princess something and the blue demon uses this chance to escape. She addresses her clan and says that her father, their lord, has passed away after being taken ill. This is terrible news for the expulsionists, as without her father's army they cannot proceed with their planned uprising and must lay down their arms. She says that she will seclude herself in her inner chambers, for her own safety. The Satsuma clan's priority is now to secure their own future. In other news, it appears that the blue demon killed Taka without approval from the chief minister, so he essentially relieves the blue demon of his duties. The following year in 1860, Genzui has come up with a new plan. 
plan is to attack the Red Demon head on. The expulsionists will intercept the Chief Minister's convoy whilst he is en route to the Shogun's castle. It's a fierce battle and whilst fighting against E, the Blue Demon steps in to lend a hand. The more the merrier as he's defeated as well. The protagonist is faced with a choice, to kill E or to spare him, but this doesn't have an impact on the main story. It's 1863, three years have now passed since the Sakurada Gate incident and the death of Chief Minister E. After his death, the trade talks have been suspended and the Americans have been driven out of Japan by the growing rebellion, now even more emboldened by the plummeting authority of the Shogunate. But just as E feared, the British would come in instead, headed up by British Consul General Rutherford Olcock. Meeting up with the Choshu clan at their villa in Edo, the protagonist speaks with Katsura. It seems that the British are building a legation, basically an embassy, and the Choshu clan's plan is to burn it down. What's interesting, at least to the protagonist, is that a samurai with a peculiar hand was seen leaving the legation. A couple of young members of the clan are lending a hand. These two men are called Ito Hirobumi and Yamagata Aratomo. Some of the expulsionists meet up and observe the British legation, and they spot Rutherford Alcock along with the man the protagonist met at the Grand Villa five years prior, Ernest Sato. The protagonist and Ryoma meet on the hill overlooking the legation and discuss their plan of action. They are to go down below and stir up a commotion by fighting the guards, whilst Ito and Yamagata start a fire, and then afterwards they will go after Rutherford Alcock. The plan goes pretty well with the guards well distracted and the fire has been started. Ito and Yamagata state that Alcock has a bodyguard with him and that can only mean one thing, the Blade Twin. As expected, she is there. Fighting both Alcock and the Blade Twin, the group prevail. The Blade Twin then escapes with Alcock. Ryoma overlooks the burning legation and says to Genzuri that he's gone too far. Signs that Ryoma is starting to have trouble with the lengths the expulsionists are willing to go to, saying that they are no better than the Red Demon in harming innocent bystanders. But Genzuri says that this is just the start. Meeting up with Ryoma later on at the Pleasure District, the protagonist attends the Choshu clan banquet. They once again find Katsura blind drunk, bothering some poor bloke. At the banquet, they talk about Master Shoen's vision. Ito mentions a firework display being held by the river, and Genzuri reveals their next step, to kill a man named Kaishu Katsu. Since the Red Demon is gone, Katsu is now the man at the heart of the Shogunate, and luck has it will be attending the fireworks. The protagonist heads to the Azuma Bridge to meet up with Ryoma. They manage to make it to Katsu's boat under cover of night, along with the sound of the fireworks. They fight Kaishu Katsu. They don't end up defeating him, as the guy is majorly skilled. The three of them stand there watching the fireworks. Romo explains that the rebels went too far with the legation, but that they do have cause since the shogunate killed Master Shoin. Katsu reveals his plans to build Japan its own navy. With their own navy, foreigners will think twice about trying to intimidate them. He argues that it's better to try and fix the shogunate, to reinvent it rather than try to overthrow it. Not wanting to be part of the murder of innocents and desperate for a better way to change their nation, Ryoma agrees to help Kaishu Katsu out. Later joining up with Katsu at his estate, he says that they need to learn from the West as well as calling upon Japan's strengths. They need recruits, an army, medicine in order to combat the cholera outbreak, and swordsmen skilled in the martial arts. So Ryoma and the protagonist get to work putting all of this into action, and in exchange Katsu will try and find information on the Blade Twin. For the army, the protagonist meets with a man named Takayaki Enomoto, an admiral. He informs the protagonist of a drill taking place inside Edo Castle involving shogunate soldiers being trained by the French military. Fighting their way through the French military's base, this impresses Jules Brunet. Brunet says that they can rely on French support. Enomoto tells the protagonist to go and speak with a man named Tatsugoro Shinmon. He's a spiky fellow, but he says that he needs help in clearing out some arsonists from a temple. The protagonist heads to the temple and clears out the arsonists. Afterwards, Tatsugoro says that if the protagonist can defeat him, he'll provide skilled recruits. So the protagonist beats Tatsugoro in a fight. In terms of medicine, the protagonist goes to the Kanda Medical School. He speaks with a female medicine practitioner called Ine Kusamoto. She says that after studying Western medicine, she's studying a cure for cholera but hasn't had much success, as the medicine she did make emits a poisonous gas if not properly sealed. Therefore, the anti-shogunate forces want to know how to make it and have been harassing her. She's been irresolute, but the expulsionists are planning to attack her lab. Helping her defend her lab from the expulsionists, who are being accompanied by mask-wearing Ito and Yamagata, she mentions that another physician, a Dr. Shosaku Narasaki, 
who had been rounded up in the recent purge and is in custody, had come up with a concoction that eased the symptoms of cholera. Going to the prison, his daughter Rio is there. Shosaku is about to be executed, so finding their way into the prison by being arrested and after fighting a massive executioner, they reach Shosaku and break him out, and he goes to the medical school. And finally, their search for swordsmen leads them to the Chiba Dojo. Speaking with Ryoma, he reveals that he used to go to this dojo a lot when he was younger, but that something happened the last time he was there, leading to him being too scared to go in there. Speaking to a man named Hachiro Kiyokawa and outlining their plan to reform the Shogunate, we find out what Ryoma was scared of, a young woman named Sana, also known as the Demon Bell of Chiba. Ryoma, the smooth talker, had promised this woman that he would propose to her. So, naturally, she bets this proposal on winning a fight. Ryoma chickens out and the protagonist is forced to fight her. He defeats her and she's upset that the proposal now won't happen. Anyway, with that drama over, the protagonist speaks with Hachiro, who is itching for a fight too. And after this, Hachiro agrees to help in the reforming of the Shogunate. Returning to Katsu, the protagonist reports their success. Katsu tells the protagonist that the Blade Twin is working with the British as an intermediary, setting up weapon sales with the high and mighty in Japan, and Katsu doesn't like it. Heading to the newly formed military academy, Katsu tells the protagonist that the Shogun will be there at the academy, observing a martial arts competition. Naturally, the protagonist enters the competition. Fighting and defeating three opponents, the protagonist has to fight one more, a mysterious samurai who, after being defeated, identifies himself as the Shogun. The protagonist and Ryoma had previously met this man, Yoshinobu Takagawa in Yoshiwara. He was the man being pestered by Katsura. Yoshinobu is impressed by the protagonist and says that with warriors of the caliber being trained at the academy, he can get Japan back on its feet to make Japan equal to any foreign land. Afterwards, Yoshinobu is talking with his people and it's revealed that he intends to follow the orders of the Imperial Court to go to Kyoto and find the people who want to topple him and put the Imperial Court in his place. He wants to end this conflict. Yoshinobu, prior to becoming Shogun, was named Keiki Tokugawa. He was the seventh son of Nariaki, and when he was adopted into the Hitotsubashi family, this brought him forward in line for succession to the Shogunate, becoming head of the family and changing his name to Yoshinobu. However, a young boy, Emochi, was chosen to be Shogun instead, coming from another Tokugawa faction led by Naisuke I. Yoshinobu and his father were forced into house arrest, and Yoshinobu was forced to step down as the head of the Hitotsubashi family, and this was around the time that the Harris Treaty was being disputed. After his assassination by the anti-shogunate rebels, Yoshinobu was restored to his position as the head of the Hitotsubashi family. In 1862, Yoshinobu became the guardian of the shogun by way of a compromise in response to demands that the shogun yield some of his power to the emperor, and he worked to bring the emperor and the shogun closer together. Yoshinobu would be flanked in his role by his two closest allies, Katamori Matsudaira, who became the military commissioner of Kyoto, and Yoshinaga Matsudaira, who became chief of political affairs. But it's important to remember that at this point, at least in real life, Emochi was technically still the shogun. Yoshinobu turns to one of his allies, Katamori, and tasks him with forming an army with the purpose of defending Kyoto, calling it the Roshigumi. This is opposed by others in Yoshinobu's party, but the plan is put into motion nonetheless. Back at the Longhouse, Ryoma tells the protagonist that Katsu requires something else doing. Speaking with Katsu, he says that the Roshigumi are acting as Yoshinobu's escort. Katsu thinks that the Roshigumi is a front. Outwardly, they appear to be giving peasants and other ronin the chance to earn a good living, but really its main purpose is to weed out any enemies of the shogunate. Katsu wants Ryoma and the protagonist to go and join up with the Roshigumi. Getting there and speaking with Hachiro, it seems that two troublemakers joined up and have been picking fights with everyone, so you guessed it, the protagonist, Ryoma, and another hopeful recruit, Kotu Nakazawa, have to go in and sort them out. Whilst fighting both of the troublemakers, another samurai shows up and puts an end to the fight. Katamori tells them that they are all to be recruited into the Roshigumi. Leading Edo for Kyoto, the anti-shogunate forces also set out for Kyoto in the hope of ambushing the shogun. There's a slightly large problem on the way into Kyoto though. A checkpoint named the Ejiri Post has been taken over by some ruffians who had earlier killed and robbed some Choshu clan retainers. Their scheme is to get rich by charging people to get through the checkpoint. Roma mentions that Genzuri and the Choshu forces have made it to the edge of the post. Ryoma suggests teaming up with the expulsionists to achieve a common goal of getting rid of the ruffians. Speaking with Katsura, he is keen to join forces. The Choshu forces will launch a surprise attack from the back, and the Roshigumi forces will attack from the front. 
Choosing to either go with the expulsionists or the Roshi Gumi, the protagonist helps liberate the checkpoint. With the checkpoint liberated, it seems that fighting alongside one another, they have gained a mutual respect. The two opposing sides have a drink and celebrate their victory and their journey into Kyoto. Meanwhile, a meeting is taking place between Hachiro and Ernest Sato. Well, I'd have expected your Roshigumi to be here by now. Patience, you're too anxious. The Roshigumi are on their way to Kyoto, I assure you. What happens next is anyone's guess. Nothing. We both know your real goal is to weaken the Shogunate from within. Perhaps. But what to do with all those fine warriors? Their skills could be useful in a number of ways. In any case, it depends on the course you decide to take. We await a favorable response. The culture this nation still calls its own is worthy of admiration. If only I could say the same for all of its people. A real shame. So it seems that Hachiro was actually part of the anti-shogunate faction, and he was trying to sell the services of the Roshigumi to the highest bidder. They suspect that someone inside the Roshigumi is a snake. The shogunate has ordered them back to Edo, but Isami Kondo, now the group's leader, objects, stating that the shogun could be in danger. The Roshigumi is about to be torn apart. Ryoma and the protagonist have to make a choice. Despite Ryoma's only goal being Japan's future and the protagonists being finding their blade twin, and not really being aligned to either side's true cause, they can choose to stay with the Roshigumi or to rejoin with the Choshu forces. A meeting is called and in line with whichever particular choice, Ryoma and the protagonist can either choose to stick with the Roshigumi and offer their services in Kyoto, or to leave and join the Choshu faction. As a result of the split in the Roshigumi it was disbanded and the Shinsengumi was formed in its place, a private police force that would watch over and protect Kyoto itself. Now, if the protagonist chose to ally with the Choshu forces, they speak with Katsura. He is dubious as to whether or not he can trust them. Nonetheless, he accepts them back in. He says that there is an assembly taking place soon at the Akeda Inn, and he invites them along. A master Tezo Miyabi is going to be there, a man who is an important figurehead in the anti-shogunate movement. However, arriving at the assembly, they overhear that the Akeda Inn is being raided by the Shinsengumi forces. They rush there to help and defeat the Shinsengumi attackers and save Mr. Miyabe. Mr. Miyabe chooses to sacrifice himself for Katsura to escape after telling Katsura to get himself out of harm's way, that if the movement loses Katsura, then they lose control of Choshu. Miyabe then blows himself in the Akeda Inn up. After the Akeda Inn incident, the protagonist, Roma and Katsura have to fight their way back to the Choshu estate. They are ambushed by Isami Kondo. After defeating him, he tells the protagonist that if they want to make a name for themselves, they should go back to the Shinsengumi. He then leaves. Katsura says that the meeting at the inn was top secret and wonders who could have leaked it. He realises that he needs to do what Master Miyabe said and to stay alive. So he goes into hiding, in the hope that his anonymity would allow him to keep his ear to the ground and find out what the Shogunate and the nobility are planning. Going back to the incident prior to the Akeda Inn, if the protagonist decided to side with the Shinsengumi instead, they take part in the raid of the Akeda Inn. This culminates in the protagonist fighting against Master Miyabe and Katsura. After the battle, Soji appears to be very sick, and Kondo leaves to get him to safety. As seen in the anti-shogunate path, Mr. Miyabe sacrifices himself and Katsura goes into hiding, and outside, after the explosion, the protagonist tells him that Katsura got away and that Miyabe is dead. In a separate Choshu meeting around this time, a man named Shintaro Nakaoka shows up. He reports that the Choshu troops are in the mountains ready for battle. Meanwhile, Yoshinobu is making moves. He is meeting with the Satsuma clan, and he reveals that the Satsuma clan were preparing for something and had traded with the British for weaponry. He convinces the Satsuma clan to join forces with the Shogunate. Now, siding with the Choshu forces upon speaking with Genzui after the Akeda Inn incident, he reveals that Katamori, the man in charge of the Shinsengumi, is amassing troops around the Imperial Court and has attempted to convince the nobility to become pro-Shogunate. With the loss of anti-Shogunate forces due to the Akeda Inn assault, he says action must be taken. If siding with the Shinsengumi upon meeting with Katamori shortly afterwards, 
He says that despite their success at the Akeda Inn, the Choshu forces have amassed an army and are rallying around the Imperial Palace. Kondo fears that if they strike, it'll be war, so the Shinsengumi need to act. This means taking the fight directly to Choshu forces. If the protagonist is on the side of the Choshu forces, they march upon the Imperial court in order to show them their intentions and to get rid of the Shinsengumi. The protagonist attacks from the southern gate and sets out to find Isami Kondo. After defeating two members of the Shinsengumi, the protagonist gets to Kondo. A difficult fight against Kondo follows, but he is eventually defeated. On the side of the Shinsengumi, the protagonist goes to the Imperial Palace and fights against the Choshu forces. This culminates in a fight against Genzui, and he too is eventually defeated. The area then comes under bombardment by the Satsuma forces using their British weapons, with the Satsuma clan having recently allied with the Shogunate. One of their leaders, Takamori Saigo, says to kill all the Choshu forces. As a result of this bombardment, the protagonist watches everything burning, which brings up painful memories of what happened to their village all those years ago. The Blade Twin, never far away from chaos, shows up. She says that Kyoto will be burned to ashes. The protagonist once again faces off with their Blade Twin. She asks the protagonist to join her. Naturally, the protagonist refuses, and upset by this, the Blade Twin retreats. Meanwhile, Genzuri, having been injured by the Satsuma Cannon bombardment and backed into a corner, chooses to commit seppuku instead of being taken. The Choshu clan had been defeated and had been branded traitors. Why are so many willing to die for an idea? I never think about those left behind. <laughs> Gensui was chasing your brother's dream. For all our sakes, he wanted to build us a new Japan. I'm afraid I would never understand. How can you create a peaceful world through war? Roma and the protagonist, disturbed by what they have seen, part ways with the Shinsengumi and head to Honoji Temple, as the remaining Choshu forces, including Shinsaku, are under siege by the Shinsengumi. Fighting their way through the temple grounds, Roma and the protagonist fight against Shinsengumi member Soji Akita, who appears to be very sick. Shinsaku needs medical assistance, so they take him back to the Choshu estate where he is able to recover, thanks to Ryo. Ryoma asks where Katsura may be, and Shinsaku gives Ryoma a letter. They think it's from Katsura, who says the time has come. They go to track Katsura down, as they need him in order to keep what's left of the Choshu forces in line now that Genzuri is gone. Arriving at the riverbank mentioned in the letter, they see a homeless man fighting off some attackers. After aiding the man, he's revealed to be Katsura. Katsura reveals that whilst lying low, he learned that the Shogunate are making moves to send in a force to deal with Choshu very soon. What's more is that the Satsuma clan is to make up a large part of that attacking force. Roma suggests approaching the Satsuma clan and joining forces. A difficult task since the Satsuma and Choshu clans are sworn enemies. Saigo, the commander of the Satsuma forces, is at Kaiomizudera Temple. So Roma, Katsura and the protagonist head to the temple in an attempt to convince Saigo to join up with Choshu. Making their way to the top, Roma and the protagonist have to fight Saigo and his massive dog after defeating them, he's open to hearing what they have to say to him. Saigo pretty much confirms that the Shogunate coerced the Satsuma clan into allying with them, but it was the Choshu who drew their swords first. Katsura shows up, and after a short conversation about the future of Japan, Saigo agrees to join forces with Choshu. Saigo defied the Shogunate's orders, and the assault on the Choshu was called off, and the Choshu-Satsuma alliance is now aimed at overthrowing the Shogunate. <laughs> 
Don't you remember what I told you back then? That I had a dream as big as the damn ocean. <laughs> <laughs> This way. Okay, plan. Ah, uh, this is a real mess. <laughs> uh. After being attacked at the Terada Inn, Ryoma Sakamoto took refuge amongst the Satsuma clan. Might not be so lucky next time. I'm going to have to leave things to you for now. I'm counting on you. Speaking with Katsura and Saigo, they think someone in the Shinsengumi was responsible for the attempt on Ryoma's life. They need the protagonist to hide their identity and to infiltrate the Shinsengumi's outpost. Doing so and passing their initiation puts him in contact with a member of the organization by the name of Hajime Saito. The protagonist sees Soju there who is still very sick. The protagonist fights against Saito as a final test and defeats him. He introduces the protagonist to a man named Ito. Eavesdropping on Ito and Saito's conversation at the request of Saito, the protagonist overhears that the attempt on Ryoma's life was planned and carried out on the orders of Ito as a way to try and rouse the Satsuma and Choshu clans. Ito is a traitor and wants to break away from the Shinsengumi, so therefore the Shinsengumi had nothing to do with the attempt on Ryoma's life. He just wanted to tarnish the Shinsengumi's reputation. Saito needs the protagonist's help in ridding the Shinsengumi of Ito and his secret faction. Meeting up with Saito a bit later in Arabana Koji, they wait for Ito to show up. When he shows, they ambush his faction, however, Ito isn't with them. Further up, they defeat Ito's brother, and then eventually Ito himself. Saito reveals that he knows the protagonist has an ulterior motive, but he takes no action and then leaves. Reporting their findings back to Katsura, a now recovered Roma returns, and he says that he's got a solution to all their problems. He pulls out a piece of paper, saying that they need to show it to Yoshinobu Tokugawa. However, certain people are plotting. I intend to return this nation to a better era, but certain people will need to be removed. Yoshinobu Tokugawa, the last shogun. A fine title for a history book, wouldn't you say? Heading to Nijo Castle with Ryoma, they find it strange that there are no guards there. Corpses lie everywhere, and they need to find Yoshinobu. The British are there, and after fighting their way through them, they come across Ernest Sato there trying to assassinate the shogun. They defeat Sato and his British goblins alongside Yoshinobu. Satu says that a country can't function properly when the army, the shogunate, controls the government, the emperor. Yoshinobu decides to imprison Sato rather than to kill him, as they can't afford to antagonize the British. Roma tells Yoshinobu that Sato is actually correct. He presents the shogun with the piece of paper, and on it is a plan. This brings forward the end of the Tokugawa rule in Japan. The government is to be reformed, but people are still plotting and scheming. Oh, yeah. Let's 
Ecke. Is this your doing? You formally relinquish power only to launch an offensive? That is nonsense. Someone is clearly trying to frame me. To drive a wedge between me and the new administration. I will not ignore this calumny! You believe us to be behind this? I beg your pardon. My lord, you are not safe here. We must get away and fast. Hmm. So you feel no need to flee, I take it? With the Blade Twin and the British trying to make it look like the Shogun is behind an offensive, and with the Satsuma clan itching for a scrap, things are in danger of spiralling out of control again. It seems they're not going to change their minds. Later, a chat with Katsura sees him state that he's angered Ryoma by telling him that he's kidding himself if he thinks that the Satsuma Choshu Alliance will ever accept Yoshinobu being part of the new administration. Anyway, Katsura asks the protagonist to keep an eye on Ryoma and also to talk him around. So the protagonist heads to Omi Inn. Speaking with Ryo, she says that Ryoma is plotting something. The protagonist heads off with Ryo to grab a gift that Ryoma would like. But walking back towards the inn, they hear a commotion coming from it. Running to the inn, the protagonist finds the British there. The Shinsengumi are there too, and a fight ensues. After defeating them, the protagonist finds Ryoma. You can't stop the war, no one can. This nation will descend into chaos. And why would you want to? This is the world we longed for. It's here at last. <coughs> Yoma! Shintaro has been wounded. He needs a doctor. I've finally seen it. The new shape this country must take. I'll get help. Don't try to speak. We must gather everyone with ability. Regardless of social status. Farmers, craftsmen. Decisions should be made by a parliament. A forum where we can exchange ideas. A new dawn is breaking. I see it so clearly. I'll leave the rest to you. I secured your release. You might show some gratitude. Thanks to you, the negotiations have soured considerably. Now, about those weapons you have for sale, we'll take all you have. Back at the Longhouse, Katsu shows up and offers his condolences regarding the death of Ryoma. He says that a fight is all but inevitable, and people want blood. The protagonist tells Katsu that the Demon Claw Samurai is their blade twin. Katsu says that it's inevitable that the protagonist and their blade twin are going to have to end it someday. Anyway, he says that after the death of Ryoma, the confrontation between the Shogunate and the Satsuma Choshu Alliance is already underway. This is the protagonist's final choice, to head to the Revolutionist Army's base or to join up with the Shogunate Army. The name is Jules Brunet. It is an honor to fight alongside such renowned samurai. We've been expecting you. My name is Kondo, the Shinsengumi. My Denshudai troops have finished training and are ready for battle. Finally 
the decree that the shogunate be abolished. Now we are the loyalists, and the Tokugawa, the rebels! We did it at last! Yes, our efforts have been rewarded! We have righteousness on our side! Our enemy is nothing but a disorderly rebel! To arms! The revolutionist army, led by the Choshu and the Satsuma, squared off against the Shogunate forces. And so the curtain rose on the Bushin War. If heading to the anti-Shogunate base, the protagonist heads up the hill towards the Shogunate army's main encampment, whilst fighting through the Shogunate forces, as well as soldiers from the Shinsengumi. With the Shogunate, it pretty much plays out the same, except the battle is fought downhill, and the protagonist will fight various members of the Choshu Satsuma alliance. Meanwhile... Damn you! Who are you? You who kindled the flames of war? Katsu. And the motor has brought his ship around. Please, you must escape to Edo. Never! If I flee now, the Shogun, it's over! But that's exactly what they're hoping for. Should you fall to your enemies here, war will rack the entire nation. <sighs> Lord Katamori, if you would. You burn with a desire for vengeance. Allow us to quench those flames. This is not over. The enemy's commander has fled. Now is the time. The heavens have granted us our chance. The Shogun's troops are on the verge of retreat. Let's give this everything we have! Fire! forces outnumbered the enemy, with the retreat of the Shogun, defeat was at hand. Riding high from its victory, the revolutionist army began its march on Edo. In disarray after their defeat at Tobafushimi, the remnants of the Shogunate army flee to Edo in their commander's wake. Emboldened by their victory, the revolutionist army heads to Edo, intent on delivering the final blow to its enemies. Back at the Choshu estate, Katsura mentions that Shinsaku had succumbed to his injuries sustained during the siege at the temple. He says that they are so close. Saigo says that the Blade Twin appears to be helping the anti-shogunate forces, and they leave for Edo. The 
Shogun's life is not in danger, but still he must rest up for now. I just can't understand it. Why didn't we stand and fight? With my fleet, it was a battle we could have won! We were following the Shogun's orders. He did not wish for us to fight. And frankly, Enomoto, I believe he means to lay down his very life for the million citizens of Nedo. And you will allow this? You are a samurai! Is it not your duty to protect your lord and master? It is indeed. And that's why I have a very important job for you. Enomoto must take his excellency and his men to safety overseas. The people of Edo, too, should use what ships they have to escape. Escape, you say? What are you... you can't be serious. After that, we will set Edo ablaze. I have already told Chief Tatsugoro of the firefighters our plan. We will destroy anything useful to our enemies. When they are weakened, we'll have a chance to negotiate. You really mean to sacrifice Edo? If Edo were to become a battlefield, it would be utter carnage. Countless citizens would perish. No, this is the only way. The Blade Twin is back in Edo too. Now she has joined up with a faction called the Sekihotai, who seem to be intent on carnage. The protagonist goes to see Katsu, and he says that they are currently evacuating Edo, and that the protagonist should leave too, that they are going to burn it to the ground. The Satsuma Choshu Alliance are a couple of days from Edo, so using that time, Katsu aims to use the British in order to broker peace between the Shogunate and the Alliance, but to do that they need Ernest Sato, the interpreter on their side. As well as that, Katsu needs to calm down the Shinsengumi, who are thirsty for revenge after Kondo was killed during battle. They need to do these things to prevent chaos in Edo. The protagonist gets word that the Sekihotai have entered Edo Castle and are trying to get into the inner chamber as they intend to capture Princess Atsuko, something which is sure to rile up the Satsuma clan. The protagonist offers to go to Edo Castle and rescue the princess. Getting there, the Sekihotai have been busy murdering everyone. After defeating and killing the Sekihotai's leader, Sozo Sagara, Princess Atsuko comes out of the inner chamber and thanks the protagonist for their help. Princess Atsuko writes a letter to Saigo outlining her true feelings on what is going on in regard to the conflict, and gives the letter to the protagonist. Returning to Katsu, he says that Saigo refuses to stop fighting until the Shogun is dead. The letter that Princess Atsuko gave the protagonist is an effective solution. Saigo and his Satsuma forces have set up base in the post, and are there until they move on to Edo itself. They have British artillery and battleships. The letter needs delivering to Saigo so that he can end his bloodlust. Arriving and after fighting their way through the Satsuma forces, the protagonist confronts Saigo, fights him and then gives him the letter. Reading the words of Princess Atsuko have a great effect on him, and he immediately reconsiders his position and stands down. He is willing to speak to Katsu and is willing to submit to peace talks. There is one more thing to do. Katsu needs to set things up with the new administration, but fears that the Blade Twin will likely show up and try to intervene. Sure enough, at the Satsuma base, whilst the peace negotiations are in full swing, the Blade Twin shows up, and the protagonist is there waiting for her, ready to stop her. They fight, and settle their differences once and for all. The protagonist comes out on top and defeats his Blade Twin. He is faced with a choice, to kill or to spare his Blade Twin. If he kills his Blade Twin, he strikes a final blow. Still consumed by hatred, fueled by vengeance, she sees only what she wants to see, Edo ablaze. She then thanks the protagonist for stopping her, and she then passes away, and the protagonist looks out across the city. But on the other hand, if the protagonist spares his blade twin, It's all over. Do you mean to mock me? Just like the people we hated. My only goal in life was to create a nation where we could thrive. And you're telling me to just give up? 
Mm. Why not? It's a new dawn for Japan. It could be for you too. No. I wish to leave this land. I'll watch things unfold from some far off place. Even if we are apart, still we are one. In the aftermath of this story, Yoshinobu was what would be the last shogun of Japan and enacted the Meiji Restoration which led to the overthrowing of the shogunate, restoring power to the Emperor of Japan, Emperor Meiji. With the Tokugawa shogunate coming to an end, the country's feudal system became a modern one. Emperor Meiji moved into Edo Castle and the city was renamed Tokyo, with Japan itself becoming known as the Empire of Japan or Imperial Japan. The country could now get to work in building a modern state. The people who made up the Meiji government were made up of those who showed loyalty to the emperor. This way, Japan would have its best chance at unity. Some such members of this government were Takamori Saigo and Hirobumi Ito, the latter of which would later become the first prime minister of Japan in 1885. He was actually assassinated during his second term in 1909. He was succeeded by his friend that we see in the game, Aritomo Yamagata, who later in life would become one of his political nemeses. In terms of Yoshinobu, he retired to Mito and was later pardoned, eventually being granted the rank of prince in the year 1902 and was able to return to Tokyo, later dying on the 22nd of January 1913. If you wanted to know about the Edo period and the details regarding the shogunate, along with all the real life characters such as Ryoma, Shurin Yoshida, Kaishu Katsu, Takamori Saigo, Isami Kondo, Commodore Perry and many others, Britannica is a great source of information, as well as good old Wikipedia. Some interesting trivia is that Ryoma and Ryo actually got married at some point in the timeline, with her obviously becoming a widow when Ryoma was assassinated. Another piece of trivia is that his bodyguard was actually the man who died with him, Shintaro Nakaoka. Another character in the game, Commodore Perry, seems to just disappear at the end of chapter 1. Truth is that he returned to New York and due to excessive drinking due to his alcoholism, his liver failed. He then got rheumatic fever which spread to the heart and he died in 1858. But that's pretty much it in terms of this video. I enjoyed this game, but sometimes the flip-flopping between anti and pro shogunate causes was a source of confusion as I didn't really know which side my character was really on. But either way, a pretty decent game. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like on it and subscribe if you aren't already. Comment your thoughts down below, but for now, take care and I'll see you in the next one.